So. Inga iwi, inga mana, inga hua mahi, tēnā koutou katoa. Ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, kua hua mai nei i tēnei rā, e tōtō ko ana i te ako. Ngā mihi nui ki a Professor John Heliwell, te kai korero o te rā. Tēnā koe, John, nau mai hari mai ki te tai ohanga. O Tim Eng, tōku ingoa. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome colleagues and friends from all over New Zealand, uh, from Canada, and I hope from elsewhere also. I'm Tim Ng, a Strategic Economic Advisor here at the Treasury, and it's my great pleasure uh, to be able to welcome you to this session and to host uh, Professor John Halliwell for today's uh, uh, Wellbeing Seminar uh, event. Uh, John hails from the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British Columbia, among many other affiliations, and I'm going to introduce him more fully shortly. But right up front, I do want to say how pleased I am to be able to talk with him today, talk with you, John, today about subjective well-being, well-being more generally and public policy. John and I have actually had several conversations on this topic over recent years, so I'm delighted to be able to continue that conversation with you today, with more people able to listen and participate. Thank you once again for taking your time and for sharing your thoughts on this important topic. So just before we begin, let me uh, please explain for our audience a little bit more about why we're having this conversation. Back in April, the Secretary of the Treasury, Dr. Caroline McLeish, publicly launched the work program for the Treasury's first wellbeing report, which will be published towards the end of this year. Wellbeing report to Tai Wai Order in the Māori language, Te Reo Māori, will be a report on the state of wellbeing in New Zealand, how it has changed over the years, risks to wellbeing and the sustainability of wellbeing. This seminar series uh, is part of that effort and part of the Treasury's broader work program on improving public policy to support wellbeing in New Zealand. New ideas and research evidence and the advice of experts like John are all critical for stimulating and provoking our thinking here at the Treasury. I'm certain that we'll all get plenty of provocation and stimulation from what you have to say today, John. We've had the privilege at the Treasury to host some other great speakers so far from both New Zealand and overseas, and there are more seminars to come over the rest of this year and early 2023. Um, I'll mention a couple of those at the end of the session, uh, and please look out for the flyers about those uh, that will come out in due course. So let me now turn a little bit more to uh, turn to more about John. Uh, as well as a Professor Emeritus in the Vancouver School of Economics, he is a Distinguished Fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an officer of the Order of Canada. During his very long academic career, he's been a visiting professor at Harvard University, Oxford University, and many other distinguished institutions, and has been a frequent advisor to the Canadian and other governments, including New Zealand's government. Uh, John has visited New Zealand several times, uh, including both islands, South Island and North Island, since the 70s, I believe, uh, was, was the first time. And uh, so it's great to be able to uh, continue our relationship with you here today, John. John has written many books on the subject of well-being, including Globalization and Wellbeing, Wellbeing for Public Policy and International Differences in Wellbeing, and numerous journal articles. He's a founding editor of the World Happiness Report and has edited all 10 reports that have been published so far. We'll talk about that a little bit today. I'm going to ask John mostly about the concept and measurement of subjective well-being and their uses in public policy. He's kindly agreed to share his thoughts on progress in the use of well-being economics and policy since the founding of the World Happiness Report 10 years ago. We'll also hear about his work on the role of social cohesion during this COVID-19 pandemic. So in terms of how the session will run, I'm going to aim to cover my questions in the first half, which is about 40 minutes of the seminar, and then we'll have another 40 minutes or so in the second half for John to answer questions from uh, people on the call. So if you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the chat box at any time. On our side of the Treasury, we'll collect up the questions and I'll put them to John in the second half of the seminar. You can also, if you like, indicate uh, which questions you like by using the like button and we'll do our best to cover the questions that have a lot of likes. So John, once again, welcome. Can we uh, begin by sharing a little bit more of your biographical background with our viewers um, beyond my introduction? You have, as I said, a very long and distinguished career, uh, spending many, many decades in topics. I believe most of your early work, or much of your early work, was in international macro, and then you did a fair bit on social capital as well. So how did you come to get involved in your work on subjective well-being? Um, John, can you just unmute yourself, please? It's just 
a little. Right there. Uh, just oh, right. oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, I was working uh, in the Canadian chair at Harvard for several years, and it was there was a regular group that met to talk about research in progress, uh, including that led to work on economic growth and uh, democracy based on Sam Huntington's work. And Bob Putnam was in the process of publishing his book on Italy, ma making modern democracy work. Uh, and so I started working with him on economic growth and social capital. Uh, where the broadly speaking social capital for him, and it reappears in the modern well-being literature, uh, measured the amount of trust people have with each other and the extent to which they share uh, positive social connections. Uh, and uh, we got partly into that, and then both of us decided that these social capital measures were clearly important and they needed collecting more generally by national statistical agencies. So we worked together lobbying, if you like, the Canadian uh, statistical agency and the US statistical agencies and the UK statistical agencies to gradually increase the data. Well, of course, uh, we wanted to show that these data were important. And all of the research that we and others had done had been had to how much does social capital influence economic growth? Well, we said, when you think about these, these are deeply human characteristics we're measuring and humans are deeply social people. And there must be some other way of, of judging the importance of social capital. So at one stage she said, John, do you know that people are happier in states that have more social capital of the sort we're looking at? I said, what do you mean happier? I had never used the, any of the happiness data before that time, towards the end of the last century. And I said, we in economics, we've been doing without such data for more than two centuries, assuming that we had to look at income and employment and things like that to measure the quality of life. If we can get a direct measure of the quality of life, that will allow economics to go back to its roots, where it really was about life as a whole, and not just about how much people made and how they spend spent their money. So I immediately uh, declared myself, I got a fellowship to Oxford and, and uh, appointed myself as uh, Aristotle's research assistant and went back to the fundamentals and found data, in the first case from the World Value Survey, in order to test his propositions about what, meant, what it meant to have a better life. Well, we sort of went on from that supported on the one hand through the uh, Bhutanese and their gross national happiness movement that I was involved with from its early days and the Gallup World Poll, which I was also involved with from their early days. So these threads came together. You asked about the origin and it really came from looking for a better way to value social capital. Oh, that's that's excellent. Um, so social capital then turned into a social like a like a formal measure for happiness. Maybe could you describe a little bit, or, or yeah, maybe maybe explain for our listeners subjective well-being. There, there's now uh, a reasonable consensus about how to measure that concept for the for quantitatively for the purposes of studying its drivers, etc. Would you would you mind just uh, telling us that story a little bit? <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, when I first got into the field, when I mean, it was wonderful to enter a new field. That psychology for me was a new field at that time. I was so fortunate to be accepted as an active colleague by Ed Diener and Danny Kahneman and others who really had been at the forefront of this field for quite a long time. So it was a very steep learning curve. One of the core propositions uh, from Diener's work, essentially, and others, where that there are three ways of looking at subjective well-being, positive emotions, negative emotions, and life evaluations. And uh, so we started measuring those, and they were part of the Gallup World Poll. Uh, but it was pretty clear from the outset, reading Aristotle, uh, but more than that, that the life evaluations have a central umbrella role. 
And as Aristotle said, yes, positive emotions are very important, but they're just part of the story. Living a good and morally upright life is really important, but it's just part of the story. And to look at the whole story, you get people, he said, in a reflective moment and ask them about their lives as a whole. So although we measure it in the UK, for example, or four, four variables being measured in their well-being suite of questions, happiness yesterday, anxiety yesterday, uh, a sense of life purpose, and overall life evaluations. Well, quite clearly, right from the very beginning of the World Happiness Report and before that, the life evaluations are the central measure, and a life purpose is really important, but it's one of the drivers of a better life. Similarly, positive emotions are very important supports for it. And indeed, we find things like uh, having someone to count on it directly affects your overall life evaluation, but it also affects your positive emotions. So a lot of that effect is essentially flowing through positive emotions to the umbrella measure. So how do I how do I put a number then on my how I would evaluate my life? What is the question that that gets asked in the surveys? Well, uh, we've done a certain amount of study of that, fortunately, because some multiple questions have been used in the same survey and we're able to triangulate. I use the same term life evaluations because all of the questions we consider are essentially that. But uh, the main one recommended by the OECD and used in many national surveys is how satisfied are you with your life as a whole? And the standard scale now is zero to 10. 11 point scales have some advantage. You got a fixed midpoint and so on. So people have played with much shorter scales and typically there's more information in the longer scale, at least up to 11 points. My guess is it will go on further with sliders and things like that at one time or another. The Gallup World Poll, in part through its connections with Gallup in early days, have used uh, the Cantrell ladder. Uh, Hadley Cantrell invented it, and it's supposed to be a little more uh, responsive to changing circumstances, um, but it asks you to think of your life as a ladder with the best possible life as a 10 and the worst possible life as a zero. How would you rate your life today? Uh, and then the European Social Survey, and this helps us to triangulate and explain things to people who think if it's a world happiness report, it's just about some flaky emotion of happiness. It's not really about a good life. That the that survey, the European Social Survey, also asks the question: uh, How happy are you with your life as a whole? And that permits us to make the philosophical distinction, what the Marcia Sen has made and other philosophers have made, between the emotion of happiness and being happy about something. Because of course you say, and the, one of the old examples is, are you happy with the baggage retrieval system at Heathrow? That's a judgment about how good something else is. And so it turns out people are very good at listening to questions and putting them in their conversational context, as my Oxford philosophy tutor, Paul Grice, really made famous the notion of thinking of the conversational context as the way of finding out about meaning. Well, if you ask people how happy they were yesterday, they'll, their answer will be quite different and determined by different things than if you ask them how happy they are with their life as a whole. Ask them about happiness of life in a whole. The answers are very similar to those from a life satisfaction question. Also similar to those you get from the Cantrell ladder, not identical, and they have, but if you actually use the three different versions of the question on the same, and there's no survey with all three in the same survey, but there some surveys have two, and, and then you can mix and match and, and, and triangulate, uh, they essentially produce the same answer. Uh, and so we like to keep different kinds of questions in play just to make sure the science is robust. But basically, the key results do not depend on which version of a life evaluation question you use. And happiness with life gives you very different answers and more important answers than how happy were you yesterday. That's, that's, uh, that's good to know. So for developed countries, let's say, what would most people score? If on, your score on the scale of 1 to 10, 
um, what what would be the average what would an unhappy person that was not satisfied with their life say typically, and what would somebody that was very satisfied say? What's the sort of you said developed countries, but the world happiness is about, about the world. So let me tell you first about the world. The uh, mean is almost exactly five, which means in some sense, uh, people are interpreting Hadley's ladder correctly, and they have a pretty shrewd idea of the best possible and the worst possible and where they are located. Uh, if you look at the developed countries, the average would be somewhere between six and seven. Some countries above, uh, well above seven, and you know the top ten are always above seven. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's, it certainly seems as though we've we've got uh, what you're arguing to be as a, as a reasonably robust measure that's measuring something important. Uh, and as I'm as I'm sure you're explaining, my understanding is that it is. Um, at least correlated, if not caused by other things that are important. Um, so maybe if you could uh, talk a little bit, um, please, about why, uh, well, you're an advocate of using subjective well-being measures as uh, a guide for policy, uh, as one way of anchoring the purposes of policy and perhaps even measuring and evaluating the impacts of policy. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and why is it that you think this is a uh, you know, productive way to think about policy evaluation. Well, in a way, it circles back to the beginning of our discussion. You said, how did I get into it? I got into it because subjective well-being tells you about life. And if you're anxious to know about what kind of social capital is good and what's are bad and how much does it matter, uh, then the subjective well-being data are precisely what you need to tell you, and it'll tell you in relation to other things. You know, we find, for example, that people are willing to take a lower salary to work in a high trust environment. Of course, often they don't have to because a high trust environment is also one that on average is a more productive one and produces better jobs that are better for the customers as well as uh, better uh, for the workers. That, uh, since the data have supported the promise that I thought they might have when getting into this on a regular and continuing basis, it's then strengthened the argument for saying the only thing that stops us from using subjective well-being uh, information, and remember the key information that we get for policymaking from this, is when we use other variables, all these things in the dashboards of the well-being economy or in the dashboards of the OECD. These are all very important things. The various star elements in the Bhutanese uh, uh, star of, of important things, they're all really important. What we do with the science of well-being is say, well, let's look at how those various things are playing out in the society we're looking at, whether it's a neighborhood or a company or a nation, and say, what's the relative importance of having this, that, or the other thing? And often we sort of measure it in terms of its income equivalents, but you can measure it in terms of anything else. It's just telling you the relative importance of various features of life. Well, government policy is about enabling people to advance themselves and their interests in the most efficient way. It's up to the government uh, to have the roads and the railways and the, uh, and the legal systems uh, that allow people to flourish. We know, for example, that one of the key variables that show, shows up ever since we looked at it, thank goodness this question was in the Gallup World Poll, do you have freedom to make your key life decisions? Very strong variable everywhere. So if you then say, this is a, somebody might say, well, if you take this seriously, it's a big brother situation. You say, well, if you take it seriously, it isn't a big brother situation because you won't want big brother situations to help people's well-being. They value their chance to build with others a framework and develop their own lives in a framework that there is honest, is supportive, uh, but is not directed by somebody else. So uh, from what we've learned, uh, there's now a lot of information that permits policymakers uh, to make shrewder decisions. I mean, they've always, it's always, you ask any government what its objective is, it always said we're trying to make life better for people. In part, we've 
I don't want to go on too long about this, but in part because uh, there is an evidence that my colleague Richard Laird always emphasizes this point. He says, you know, countries where people are happy reelect the governments in question. Uh, and there is a certain amount of evidence that that's true. And it's, it's always been true in what they assumed in their speeches, right? The whole idea is we're about to make life better for you. Well, we're now got some evidence as to whether in fact that's happening. Uh, and that's it's humbling uh, for all of us as policy advisors and, and as policy makers, uh, because you often don't know the whole story. And uh, some things you thought would be very good turn out not to be so good. Well, let, let's let's um, take some examples of that, John. So often you will hear one will hear politicians say, "Yes, we want to make life better for people," and then the next breath they'll say, "So we're going to build houses over here, or we're going to have a bridge over that river, or we're going to invest in schools, uh, or you know, we will invest in safety and more, more cops on the streets." Can you think of examples where, um, or can you give us an example where the use of subjective well-being in a, in a kind of practical policy intervention or, or program, government program, has been particularly successful? Or how's, how's it changed the way that the policymakers thought about delivering those types of things? Let me give you one uh, example that I was it changed, uh, it allowed me to make this case with more confidence. Uh, the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation in Canada is a, a, a non-profit enterprise set up in the first instance by governments, but independent of government, and has now got customers who are coming from cities or provinces, nations, uh, in order to do experimental work looking at what makes sense. And so the program I'm going to talk about was one that took people who were on welfare or unemployment, gave them the same income they would have had on welfare or unemployment, but instead have them work with, collaborate with uh, the community leaders in their own community to undertake community services. So yes, it was a job. It was a job with a function. Its aim was to build a better community. Of course, it was to keep them in more interested and more valuable uh, than they would have been uh, probably if they were just receiving uh, the benefits of the unemployment insurance. And they found the cost benefit analysis of the conventional sort was after all this had gone on, roughly people ended up in the same jobs they had before with the same income. Uh, and it was it was favorable, but it wasn't a knocking it out of the park. Uh, but then we measured, or they measured, um, the degree of social trust in these neighborhoods. And in these neighborhoods where these communities were connected by people who were otherwise not engaged in the communal life, in the communal life and helping other people to connect, they were quite deliberately building social capital. And it turns out the actual measures of trust in these neighborhoods rose significantly. Uh, and it's particularly in those places where the activities were of a sort where they were likely to influence the way in which people connected with each other and trusted each other. So then we went back and used, or they went back, I was throwing in advice from the sides that it's their project, um, and use data from subjective well-being research to show the value of social trust to people's lives. And it's, it's pretty big. And so it changed the whole cost benefit analysis. So what they were learning uh, by the subjective well-being data radically changed how they thought about that kind of policy. So it converted something that was otherwise not much better than just conventional welfare policies into something that was quite a lot better. It's that's that's fascinating. So, to what it, it's that's a specific intervention in a particular time and place uh, with particular population or particular group of people, particular life circumstances, if you like. How generalizable do you think are these are these lessons, um, or what was that sort of evidence? Would you do you think we now have enough evidence to say that? Approaches like that can be scaled. Um, can they be generalized to other cultures, um, other countries? Uh, what, how, what would be your view on that? Uh, uh, nuanced. Uh, the the uh, 
they're, the world is a complicated place. So the first thing I might mention is that we find these uh, attempts to explain subjective well-being and what's are important to people in different cultures in different countries, remarkably consistent across countries and cultures. So there's an essential humanity that is tapped into and answered by people's answers. Uh, the scalability and applicability of, of results that come from specific experiments, as you know, is complicated. Uh, and there, I can I'll, let me give you one other example where we've been looking at that. Uh, there's a whole lot of evidence from around the world that uh, it's potentially a pretty costly program to incarcerate older people in elder care facilities and to lock children into schools and and not allowing either the chance to meet with, educate, and socialize the other. So there is a particular experiment that was being run and has been run for several years in Saskatoon, where it takes a grade six class and has it taught for the whole year in an elder care facility. Now we've been studying that with the collaboration of the teachers and the elder care people for now two or three years. And even during COVID, this was all being done and with, with video calls and so on. And you could just see the extent to which the lives of these individual students and elders and staff members, and even the people who work in the cafeteria were changed by the enlivening that was got by bringing that social context and making it real. These weren't outside services provided to people. It was just bringing people together in a context where they had the freedom and the opportunity to help each other and to meet each other and to support each other. So the next question, which is your question, how scalable is this? So that's one of the next research questions we're looking at because it's so obviously a good thing. It's been known about for years. Why isn't everybody else lining up and doing it? Why do we keep responding to anything that happens by locking the doors, not opening the doors? Well, you will well know from your policy making experience, if something goes wrong, somebody gets blamed. And so it's quite typical to have risk committees everywhere now. We want to do everything we can to avoid anything going wrong. Well, of course, what that automatically does is stop anything important going right, because what you do is shut doors. So you ask the people, and I've met with operators of elder care facilities and said, why aren't your experiments with running uh, daycare centers there in the summer? And, and, and how did you make that happen? Did you have to break any rules? Oh, she said, we, you bet we did. <laughs> so you have to have the capacity to break rules that were designed with sort of okay principles in mind, but in neither case uh, the, for the schools or for the elder care, were they really thinking about the happiness of the people involved, whether they be the teachers or the inmates. So then in the, in the global happiness policy report, we ask quite explicitly about your scalability question. Uh, and it turns out the culture of fear, well, there's, and of avoiding of risk is enormously costly. So what that means is you have to have a lot of good evidence in order to break down that, oh, that's too complicated. We have all these rules and so on. And if we let people, all these kids, something could happen, right? An elder could trip over a kid running in the corridor. Well, of course the elder could. The elder would be much less likely to trip being incarcerated in a wheelchair in front of a television set, but that's not the life they want to have. It's not the life we should be giving them. You see the example. You have to show people the examples, make them obvious enough that they're willing to take the extra step to try something. Because what we do know is that these kind of social connections that are got easily at no extra cost by this grade six class being taught in an elder care facility uh, are life-changing for those people. Well, why aren't we doing it more in the end? We're, I haven't got a full answer to that, but I think there are threads of it in what I've said. Well, let, let's turn to um, the World Happiness Report, uh, because I think it is, it, for those who haven't read it, um, I've commended it to you. It's on the um, website, 10 editions, and I think 
it's uh, it has quite a um, macro view, if you like. We've talked about sort of micro examples where subjective well-being has been used uh, to, you know, guide the design of particular and evaluation of particular programs. But in the World Happiness Report, you have looked across for ten years, you know, different countries' experience, um, whether it's data gathering on well-being, uh, the dashboard development, uh, you know, the incorporation of well-being analysis into um, different government policy processes. What have been the main changes you've seen over the past ten years, uh, and you know, what are, what are the good ones that you've seen that we should be encouraged by? And where do you think you know, things should go next for, for governments? <clears throat> uh, let me start with the changes we've seen over the 10 years, because I think they all open doors for governments to do more. Because if you think of from the government point of view, they want to have enough data, enough science, enough public support pushing them in this direction and rewarding them if they go there. If they're too far ahead of public opinion, uh, then anything goes wrong, they're gonna get in trouble. And if, you, if people are generally not on board, then something will go wrong or be seen to go wrong and they'll get in trouble. And uh, it's true of a lot of innovations, unless they're broadly supported, they become riskier and eventually often become too risky uh, for a government to adopt. What the important thing that quite surprising to us was the extent to which people were really hungering for some measure of the quality of life in their community and in other communities that was broader than just what was purchased and made uh, and going much beyond the no doubt important, but not life central uh, conventional economic measures because it became uh, an element of discussion in the broader public of many, many countries. We get, uh, because we know roughly, you know, from the, I think we have 20 million repeat visitors coming back uh, to the site and they're in all the countries of the world. It's not something that's focused on the countries that are supposed to be interested in happiness or so on. It's right across the world. And what it's also done, because it is absolutely true, when people first go to the report, they go and see where their country is and where their comparator countries are. Uh, and only later do they start asking, but of course, we've now had 10 years later, so almost everybody is at this stage now. They're saying, well, what is it that is importantly different in the countries that have high scores and the countries that have low scores. And what is there there we should be emulating or copying? Well, what's happened is that uh, the Nordic countries have been consistently, uh, the five Nordic countries have been in the top 10 right from the beginning. They've got other peers, uh, you know, Switzerland and Netherlands, and Canada, New Zealand, Australia turn up in the, in, the, in the top 10, but the Nordic countries have always been there. And that has made a lot of people, I mean, they're actually getting happiness tourists coming to all of those countries um, to see what's going on there. And they're sometimes policy making tourists, but sometimes they're just ordinary people wanting to look, sample life in a happy country. And they get in all the usual discussions, well, you know, why aren't you laughing in the streets uh, in Helsinki? And of course, the Helsinki experts who themselves puzzled by all this uh, top ranking, uh, they're able to say, well, after all, here's a picture of our five and four year old children walking to school in the middle of Helsinki. And that's normal. And that that should be normal uh, is abnormal in the in the world as a whole, but it's fundamental to a feeling that you're living in a better society. So these ideas of what it means to have a civilized society where people care about each other and say, well, it's really not about a social safety net, although that's part of any good story. That's not what it's coming from. It's coming from the essential caring of people for each other. And so that's changed the norms that people are using when they're saying, what kind of schools should we have? What kind of prisons should we have? Uh, what kind of neighborhoods should we be going? And there's a rural urban divide. And then so people are now saying, what can, how can we make life in big cities a little bit more like life in the better small towns where somebody you don't 
No, a stranger is just a friend you haven't met yet. And that kind of change, what can we do? What can, as individuals, not just as governments, but individuals to make that happen? So we, we have come back in, in a sense to social cohesion and social capital. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm sure people will well remember, as I certainly do, uh, the COVID, acute COVID phase and you know, massive disruption to everything. Now, the World Happiness Report, um, it's in the, the, the latest edition, I think, and the previous one maybe as well, talked about social capital, um, trust in other people, trust in institutions as, in, in, a, in a quantitative way, uh, important, um, if you like, explanators of the different experience in COVID in different countries. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? What's the, what, you know, what's the result there? Well, several elements to that research. One is that we, in comparing a whole range of countries, we found that COVID deaths were lower in tr countries where people trusted each other and trusted in their government, regardless of the official strategy that was adopted. Countries did much better if their official strategy um, was to simply eliminate the virus. Now I'm talking about the results for 2020 and 2021. It's a different game in 2022 with Omicron and, and, and vaccines. Um, but in those years, it was quite explicit. So we divided the countries into the, in, uh, the world into the eliminators and the non-eliminators. Of course, Australia and New Zealand were among the eliminators. In fact, it, the broad sample was the Western Pacific region of the WHO. Uh, within the Nordic countries, we split them between Sweden and the other Nordics and found a similar difference who were near eliminators and that uh, deaths were much lower. Now here, of course, Sweden versus the other Nordics, they're all high trust societies. And so it's quite clear that COVID success wasn't just about high trust. It also required making the right policy decisions. And the Swedish essentially took a view that in the end, if you compare their performance with the other Nordic countries, didn't get them anything. They, in the long run, they had they had more stringency than the other Nordic countries. They had way more deaths than the other Nordic countries. They had no more economic growth and, uh, and no more personal freedoms on average. They were forced into a situation that ended up being worse than the eliminators. Well, that's part of the story. So policy mattered and trust mattered. Uh, one of the surprises in the first report 2020 result, everyone was expecting subjective well-being to have fallen off a cliff because everyone was emphasizing what had been lost by uh, people staying home and all the things that they did working from home and so on. Well, as you as people now know much better, um, it's true and it's the way it should be that all the help services were inundated with calls because people were calling. But the point is, so were the services, or and they're not so often formal, of people helping each other. So, you, for example, the UK put out a, a, a request for volunteers to help each other deliver medicines and food and so on. They, their phone lines rang off, rang off the hook, or whatever the right expression is. They had, in a few days, they had more volunteers than they could use. Well, we already know uh, from lots of previous study of disasters of various sorts, when people get a chance to help others, when they get a chance to see how their neighbors are in turn helping each other, it makes them feel a lot better about themselves and about their lives. And then part of that is because we know from all our wallet dropping experiments that people like to live in a society where their wallet will be returned if it was lost. But in general, people are much too pessimistic about that. So that means that how people reacted to their neighbors and saw other people helping other people, they were surprised. They were pleasantly surprised at that. So not only did they have more contact with their, with their 
elder parents or grandparents or whatever by electronic means than they had actually had through visits before that. Um, but they were they were enjoying that. So you often find, you know, the, the group that did best demographically uh, were in fact the people over 65. And they ended up, they, they were in fact getting more contact from their loved ones than they were before that. And, uh, said, and of course it's ended up changing things one way and another. And, and not that I'm suggesting people in elder care were appropriately treated in most countries. They were the, they were uh, irresponsibly uh, treated in, in many countries, not deliberately, but because people hadn't thought about handling well-being and disease in those circumstances. But is that enough on, 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 on the COVID? Let me give you, I think there's one thing that I, I, we talked about before, of, uh, which was in the 2022 report, um, where we were, we were very surprised in the 2021 data, uh, which is now the second year of COVID, that all over the world in every region, there was a big upsurge in uh, pro-social activities, the most important being the helping of strangers. Uh, and some of the micro evidence of that is people who are not commuting long distances to work and trading uh, road rage uh, are busy uh, greeting their neighbors in the street when they're out on their walks and indeed helping them. And so there's been a big increase in, and you can imagine in big cities, that's especially valuable because otherwise often the neighborhoods are not really neighborhoods at all. So what, um, yeah, that, that's that's fascinating. There's, there's tons more we could probably uh, talk about in terms of COVID and well, maybe one final thing on COVID. Um, and I suppose this topic of social cohesion and social media, this is actually, this is not, this predates COVID in a way, the trends that I'm going <laughs> to allude to. And that's the, uh, you know, rise of social media trolling and sort of toxic social media and so on. Do you see how much of a um, sort of threat to the results <laughs> that we've seen, the positive results we've seen on the importance of um, connectedness is that you know so now we are more we're able to be more connected through social media and we're seeing some uh you know toxic behaviors as a result of that so this is, I, I know this is extremely speculative we don't have the evidence in yet but what's your view on on what's going to prevail you know are we going to keep getting better at recognizing the importance of social cohesion and social capital or you know is this a, a threat that's a real big problem we don't know, but quite clearly social media, and we had a chapter on this in a previous World Happiness Report, how destructive it was to the self-image, especially of adolescent females, um, through a whole range of shaming and boasting and a whole range of issues. Um, and so the image was getting stronger and stronger that the social media were forces for evil, not forces for good. Well, if you ask yourself how life could have survived on in the workplace, in the family, in the neighborhoods, in the actual provision of goods and services. Um, without the social media, uh, it was just very lucky that in fact all those mechanisms were either developed you know, or, or, or made available. And one of our early analyses said, at last, the social media have become social media rather than anti-social media. And it showed the possibilities for using these technologies to actually create well-being and to distribute it. Because of course the, the ability to share information and caring and good ideas is infinitely greater with these uh, multiple chains of connection. And uh, so to have these good uses and examples so obviously out there probably helps people to develop a nuanced view about it. So it's not whether you have a telephone or not, but how you use it. It's not whether you have the ability to form uh, a narrow group uh, within the global interest sphere, but how you use that. And uh, we're also getting, of course, it's one of the reasons good things about this report. The conventional media have a sort of, if it bleeds, it leads strategy. So bad news gets 
told much more frequently than good news. Well, we're coming in much more neutrally because we just have these views about how people, how happy they are with their lives as a whole. And we're finding out, of course, there's a lot more good news uh, than bad news than pe and people are too pessimistic. So uh, that's something that probably will continue out of COVID. Uh, for long, we, we don't know. And of course, there are other things going on at the same time. It's um. Let's finish. Thank you for that, John. Um. Let, let's finish this segment with just a little look to the future. What What are you working on now in this area? And um. Yeah. What What are you excited about over the next couple of years? Let's say around the World Happiness Report work uh, that's continuing. Other research that's going on that you're connected to. Well, one thing. And this is boasting. Um, well, not, not anyway. We, we've been very gratified at the extent to which what might have been regarded as a pretty flaky publication. <laughs> it is now the case that we can ask almost anybody to write a chapter for us, and they're happy to do it because they know there's an audience out there of interested people, and they're able to take their scientific research uh, and get it out of the technical journals before an audience of many million. And most of them are doing the research because they want it to be useful. And so to provide that, so it means we're able to uh, keep and build uh, an intellectual structure uh, that enables the report to be part of the evolving science of well-being. Uh, and that's very gratifying. And it also means we can be a little more ambitious about uh, what our expectations are. So uh, we're getting, you know, we had a world leaders in, in, in genetics of happiness write a chapter in the most recent one where we've had several high level uh, contributions from the scientific leaders on how uh, you can use Twitter and other forms of immediately available information to dig deeper into the other. Because, of course, in the long run, we're going to have to find better ways than voluntary surveys or in additional ways to find out how good lives are with people. We're going to have to map them in any number of other ways. Uh, we've got Tim Besley and Torsten Persson, key leaders in the uh, political science of public institutions doing a chapter in the forthcoming report on how what are the links between uh, government uh, uh, capacity uh, and uh, happiness. So all of those and of course you still have to dig deeper and deeper and we're trying to uh, raise the ambitions of national governments so that having the relevant statistics in the main social surveys, in fact, and the investigations should be thought of as absolutely normal, indeed required. Initially, as you well know, some statistical agencies said, oh, subjective measures, we can't do that. We only look at, at exactly how many people are walking the streets. Well, of course, we know that never was true, that people were unemployed if they said they were looking for work and didn't have it. Uh, so subjective measures have always been used. And the point is they didn't understand and they were kissing off the possibility that these subjective measures were really valid. Well, after all these years, it's now 20 years of this research, uh, that tide has changed. And so statistical agencies are looking to do more and uh, they will do more if their governments ask them to do so and the governments will ask them to do so if there's a general public interest so there's this circular flow of ideas and influence and knowledge that you keep it moving in the right direction uh, and nothing but good will follow excellent um, well thank you very much that's a that's a really um positive way to finish in a, the formal segment and very inspiring too. Um, let me turn to the questions um, and thank you for all the participants who have entered questions in the chat box. I'm going to go back uh, to the beginning and see if I can um, get some themes out of this. We have some stuff on uh, I guess the statistics of statistical properties of 
subjective well-being. So there's a question here, and I'm going to group them together. Um, is this happiness measure, by which I mean, by which I'm taking to mean the subjective well-being measure, is it cardinal or ordinal? Uh, then there's a question: How well correlated is national happiness with GDP? And uh, one on the distribution, if you like. Um, yeah, actually, why, why don't we start with the first two, uh, just on the cardinal and ordinal and the correlations with GDP? Well, it's formally an ordinal measure. Uh, it's a step on a ladder. Um, and then it becomes cardinal if you can attach a similar quantitative importance to a move from one step to the other. And uh, there are ways of, and, and it's been quite standard now for 15 years for people to use um, a, a probate estimation as a way of then treating it as an ordinal measure and then seeing how different the answers are than if you assume it's cardinal, which is simpler because you then you, you get a nice interpretation that is continuous up the scale. And if you do the right transformations, for example, in put income, not in dollars, but in the logarithm of income. Uh, so to get that nonlinearity, and there's some other nonlinearities you put in. But if you do, then you find the, the measure, uh, you get the results you get from the, uh, the probit analysis and the ordinary least squares analysis, essentially the same. So for ordinary people, as we all are, uh, what, you're, what this says is we treat them as cardinal without important loss of information. So that's not a worry. I mean, people still, and bless them, they still re-estimate and re-estimate just to make sure that's still true in the case they're looking at and so on, that they're not interpreting too much. And once you get out, you know, and people are now starting to look not just these following five variables are independent. They're saying, well, maybe these things are related. So the value of community, your well-being may depend by your on your age. Well, it does. So a lot of these things that we typically, for simplicity, just assume separate cardinal impacts from each of these variables. You say, well, no, when you really dig down into it and get better data, you'll find for different population subgroups, different age groups, different genders, uh, and different ways of life, some of these effects are going to be different. And that's where the growth in the science uh, will be happening. That's very reassuring indeed. Um, let me move to, so there's a question asked by Hamid, uh, which I think Arthur has answered, Arthur Grimes has answered to Hamid's satisfaction. So thank you for that, Arthur. I'll, I'll leave that uh, question there. But one from Rodney, which has been liked by four people. So we'll certainly ask that one. Question is, are there cultural or social, sorry, are there cultural or societal or national differences in the drivers of subjective well-being? What's the evidence on that? How significant are these differences, if any? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a splendid question. Uh, I'm reminded that when I was back studying social capital, um, uh, one of the definitions of social capital was that it was a cultural phenomenon. So then we say, if you've got more social capital, it's 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 different culturally, uh, and so there's a sense in which every society is going to be different uh, from other societies, and we're looking for measures that, in fact, make them look more similar. And it turns out some of these basic trust measures do that. I think I already mentioned that the drivers are very similar in all countries. We had a chapter in the most recent World Happiness Report supported by a Japanese foundation. And the argument was they were thinking, they were trying to understand why uh, the East Asian countries ranked lower uh, than other developed countries, uh, other countries at similar stages of uh, development. And uh, they said that's because these are weird questions, i.e. they come from Western educated industrial rich democracies, and they're all centric to countries of a, where everything is individualistic and et cetera, et cetera. And so it'd be a different world here. So they, they got uh, finance from the foundation to ask an extra set of questions. Uh, which in, in, which embodied uh, Eastern values. One of them was, do you uh, focus your life on others or on yourself and family? 
Uh, and uh, another one was, are you at peace with your life? Uh, and uh, there were two or three of such questions. And then they, we found out that in fact, ha having those, those are all good things. And to have them was important everywhere in the world. And the intriguing thing was the countries that had the most of these Eastern values were in fact the Nordic countries and not the East Asian countries. And that they were, they were universally important. We hadn't measured some of these before and they were important, but they were the, the most important finding was that they were important everywhere. And more, more, uh, the Eastern philosophers were right to say these were important, but they didn't get, they didn't, they, they weren't of a form that made these other measures incorrect. <laughs> because once you take them into account, they're, they're lower on their own values, if you like, uh, as well. And you can see why, right? If you look deeply into uh, South Korean life, they're unhappy with their lives for reasons that don't have anything much to do with Eastern values. They're giving up their peace. They're giving up their uh, connection with others. So uh, uh, that's a separate set of issues. Now, uh, is one more element to that, I think. Well, one of the elements was, is there quite a lot of homogeneity in effects across the world? Yeah. And as what is there left for cultural differences? So we've had two chapters, I think, on Latin America, because it's kind of special. If you sort of look uh, at a global model and then look at regional departures from that, there is and you then say, is the regional departure because life is different there in ways we just haven't measured with our variables? Or is it a cultural orientation that means all the same things? They don't mean the same to them. My view of the evidence thus far is that uh, the same things matter, but they have more of them uh, of, of some things than other countries. And there was a nice uh, chapter by Mariana Rojas where he looked about Latin American happiness. And he, this, the things that Latin Americans do more of, um, multi-generational family living, more uh, greetings in the streets, more open friendship and so on. You know, Bicyclists who've gone all around the world said they're much more likely to be taken home uh, and looked after in Latin America than in other places. That kind of open uh, connection uh, it makes people happier. So that's in itself, if it's actually more prevalent there, would explain uh, this half a point margin in, in Latin America. And he dug deeper into this by getting hold of some surveys that inquired more deeply into the structure of social life. Because the, the Gallup World Poll questions are quite limited in this structure. Just do you have someone, yes or no, to count on in times of trouble? Well, they'd gone quite more deeply into the structure of family. I think it turns out in Latin America, people have extended families because they love them, not because they're forced into them by economic circumstances. And of course, that's gonna make them happier homes than if they were uh, forced into them. Uh, so. Every time you get something where a common model doesn't fit everywhere, you're going to be looking at ways in which people th think of things and you look for differences in the way they are. And so that for the Nordic countries, people are trying to say, well, now, what is it about? What is it about those cultures that make people more likely to return wallets and make them correspondingly happier? And of course, you get to start getting some lessons pretty quickly. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, OK, so let's move on to ah, here's a here's a good one. I think this is a different dimension that we haven't talked about so much. Uh, it's from Ross, uh, who asks, are there differences between evaluating answers to life satisfaction questions to someone in their 30s and those in their 70s? Ah, uh, now differences in answering. There are age differences and there's quite a literature on the U shape in age. Does it exist or not? And how big is it? And you, you might imagine from where I start, uh, I'd say that's a funny sort. And there was even some research saying, you know, it's true even in baboons. Well, I haven't looked at 
these are baboons in zoos, right? Not I haven't looked at how bad life is for different ages of baboons in a zoo, but it's 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 not something that makes me think there's fun, something fundamental about the well-being responses based on your uh, your your chronological age. So we did quite a few studies of happiness at different ages and what it responds to. Uh, and indeed, most of the U shape uh, is eliminated if you account for the differing prevalence and the differing importance. So this gets back to Ross's question more directly. Uh, the uh, feeling a sense of belonging to your local community matters more to the old than to the middle aged. Well, you can see why, right? Because for people at an older age, the community is their life. So it becomes their workplace, their play space. It's, it's more important. While workplace trust and well-being is obviously more important for people who have jobs. The midlife crunch, which is where people have not enough time and too much to do, it's more, it's more prevalent in the middle ages. Uh, but it's much less prevalent for people who feel they have a work-life balance, so you don't get the U-shapes where people think they have work-life balance. If they think of their immediate work supervisor as a partner rather than a boss, a great part of that U-shape goes on. You improve, the, in other words, you improve the social context for a person of the age they are, in the circumstances they are, then they have a better life. Of course, middle-aged people are more likely to be in a job, uh, young people are more likely to be in education. The, the countries with better education systems have higher young, uh, young well-being than old. Countries that look after people in a more socially responsible way, improving their lives, have a bigger rise at the end. Uh, and if people are thrown off a cliff when they retire, then those are the countries where there's a continuing drop. So answer is, Yes, there are big differences by age in life satisfaction, but it really does depend on the circumstances in which they live in ways that are derivable pretty directly from universally based evidence. Right. Thank you for that. Um, it just uh, made me reflect a little bit on how you ask a baboon about their, to evaluate their lives and whether you actually get them to climb physically a cantrell ladder and stop on a particular rung, but that's a different story. Um, let me turn to a question from Christy, which is about uh, as a policy related question. And he asks, can we identify in a modeling or econometric sense the causal implications of government policies for well-being ex ante? In other words, I think, can you predict, can you reasonably predict the impact ex ante? Or can you only evaluate policy interventions ex post on something like subjective well-being? You can only get the evidence about a particular policy ex post after the fact. But if the evidence is broad enough based, broadly enough based, uh, and the new policy you're thinking about is a little bit like a cookie cutter example. In other words, you, we were talking earlier about this putting of an elementary school class into an elder care facility. Uh, I don't need to know a huge amount about the nature of the facility and the nature of the teacher and the nature of the class to predict that will work in some other place and also improve the lives. So a little bit depends on how much relevant experience you have as to how confident you are in the ex ante predictions. There are so many ways of what I, we call win-win policy choices where there's no real resources involved. It's just doing things in a different way, making people, as they said in the motto of the Singapore prison system reforms, making changing them from prisoners to being captains of their own lives. That's just a, an approach that gives people the responsibility and the opportunity to prove things for themselves. That does uh, pr produce uh, better lives. And you could, I think, fairly confidently predict that that will apply in other circumstances. One of the reasons I like the Singapore prison example was because in many countries, the prison system is a cesspit of the public service. So it's not a nice place to work. It's not a nice place to be uh, a boarder. And uh, it's not nice for the families uh, left behind. And uh, in Singapore, they changed the lives of all those parties and they got 
And it was one of those win-win circumstances because recidivism went way down and the employability of the people uh, coming out was much higher and people who previously came back as repeat offenders were back as volunteers to help the current residents. So that kind of thing is, is a really important uh, set of examples where you'd say, well, I can't be sure that's going to work everywhere uh, and you better try it on you know, you, the thing about schools and prisons and other things is you can have nice semi-controlled experiments where you have one group where you're testing this and another where you don't. And that minimizes the risks of the new policy and it increases the information you gain from trying something. And it allows you to do experimentation with moderate acquisition of risk, which as we've noted before, is a big stopper for a new policy. So the experimental approach, and I think that's an appropriate answer to the question. You can't be sure ex ante, uh, so make your experiments small and keep track of them. So you're adding to the relevance of the past for allowing you to predict the future. Excellent. Um, thank you. A uh, question from Debashis, which I think is a really interesting one. Um, it's been a back in my mind actually on this stuff. And he's asking, how can we control for the happy feeling impact on this subject of well-being measure due to media or government propaganda, for example, North Korea? And I think that there's a broader question in there, um, which may I suggest, which is about conditioning of subject of well-being or life evaluation for that matter on um, I don't know, you know, sort of habituation to cultural discourses about how good things are. You know, in North Korea, the government keeps telling you how good things are. They're better than everywhere else in the world. Um, you may start to believe that and then answer your subjective well-being questions, life evaluation questions in a way that, well, <laughs> is, it, is it still a genuine response uh, in, a, in a situation like that? <clears throat> Should we change the response? but it reflects the circumstances. I mean, we've talked quite a bit about what you think about whether your wallet will be returned. It affects, it's affected a little by your own experience, but it's affected mainly by what you read and hear in the media. Well, if those media are controlled by a government, then they're going to be important providers of the information base that affects your answer. So you could then say, well, if in fact, I didn't have that controlled media, I might feel rather differently about my life. Uh, the, the, uh, anyway, there, we haven't got the latest polls back from uh, Ukraine and Russia, but during the previous post-Crimea period, it was, it was quite striking, that the difference. You know, it, people do respond to what they hear uh, and, and how they're reacting. Uh, so it's a, it's a complicated scene. Uh, there's a more technical question here, which is when you're asking a question in a survey, does it depend on the circumstances of the survey and the other content of the survey? And you might ask what they had for breakfast. And all of those things have some impact. And it's, that's why it's really important to have many surveys. Uh, and you want to do them in as uniform a way as you can, but to the extent they're different, and StatCan is now doing some work on answers that have come from COVID time surveys, from COVID specific surveys versus the general health survey versus other things, and at looking at the, the general social survey cycles differently. The time use cycle, for example, gives uh, an average value of life evaluations is about a third of a point lower than the non-time use specialty. And our inferences is we, you, you, you focus on people's competition for their time and the extent to which they're failing to get a work-life balance, you get a lower life evaluation report. Another interesting contrast is the criminal victimization survey rounds. They give a higher average life evaluation. And our hypothesis for that is that uh, they ask questions, were you exact, were you in fact uh, subject to any of these bad things? And of course, most people weren't. And uh, so they then say, well, I was pretty lucky. <laughs> uh, and it is happening to me. So they're not drawn down by the 
answering of questions about bad things because they weren't happening to them. Uh, anyway, the, the, the important point is, yes, people, the context in which a question is asked is going to depend on the information they have at hand and the triggers they have in their minds and in their questionnaires. Uh, and it all increases the value of trying to collect other kinds of information about how their lives are going and not not be he's saying everything depends on this. It would be political suicide and it would be it wouldn't make intellectual sense to say everything depends on the answer to a life evaluation question in a particular survey of a particular source. Life is much more complicated than that. Uh, and so you, you, you have to have a certain humility as a scientist and a breadth to say we want more information about the quality of life and so the questioners uh, concern that the circumstances of the information system are going to give you a false reading it's going to give you a different reading and whether it's false and what is false in comparison to really requires more unpacking uh, and it, 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 it may be true either you can live in a fool's paradise and be happy uh, or in fact you may not know. As you may remember, uh, Marcia Sen is in early days and may still be quite skeptical of the use of subjective well-being uh, through what he called the happy peasant paradox that people were laughing and smiling in, in these African countries he visited and he said that th therefore they'll tell you they're happy but they don't have my measures of capacity and capabilities. Well it turns out the actual measures we get are much lower in those countries than elsewhere and that uh, whether they have sense capabilities are strong determinants of their answer. So th they give answers, they give sin like answers uh, to their questions and they're, they have every reason. Just because they have low levels of education doesn't mean they don't, they seem to have quite a broad conception about what, what life is and what it could be like. Mm. That's, uh, yeah, I mean to your point earlier in the uh, response to some of those questions about cultural differences and circumstance differences. There's, it's, it's great to hear about the different uh, research results on fra the effects of framing versus trying to unpick, uh, you know, the effects of circumstances versus preferences and things like that. So this is all part of that, I guess, isn't it? Um, let me move to a question on policies that aren't primarily social policies. This is a question from Matthew. And he asks, can subjective well-being be used to evaluate policies that are not primarily social policies, like Three Waters, which is in New Zealand, that is about uh, the governance arrangements for the provision of water services, drinking water, stormwater, wastewater. Um, so it's very much a regulatory. Um, well, certainly the instrument is regulatory, but there's a quite a large debate in New Zealand at the moment about other aspects uh, of that particular policy set of policy reforms. Um, and then the other example is resource management reform. Um, so, you know, planning rules, uh, uh, environmental regulations and things like that. So what would you see as the role of subjective well-being and helping to think about those types of policy problems? The, the most, uh, the 90% the of the policy relevant decisions are not in social policy. Not in, not in a bag that's now called social policy. They have to do with how you design and deliver and administer all the other policies. Uh, and which uh, handling of a water system is a classic example. There have been studies of how developing cooperative uh, management of watersheds, for example, uh, it weighs without rules or regulations, but with collaboration as to how you do that. And the same things that deliver happiness for people deliver better mechanisms. So the extent to which the people know each other, trust each other, and collaborate in the design of the framework. See, this is not top-down water management. This is bottom-up handling of a shared resource. Mm. People together to clean up a watershed, they're going to think differently about everything else, about each other, and they meet people they otherwise wouldn't have met, and so on. So you get met, met more efficient results at the micro level, the handling of the water system, but the extent to which these mechanisms used are ones that enable people 
to, to be active agents in the design of better systems for themselves and others. They're not just happier, but you get much better results. I, I've had discussions when talking about these things to uh, Danish entrepreneurs. Uh, I just happened to be giving a talk at the annual business summit where they were giving prizes for the best innovating companies. And it was quite clear I got to talk to some of these best innovators. They were all once where the administrative structure was flat, where everybody got to talk to every, the pay structure was also much flatter. And they shared ideas and they covered each other's backs and they cared about each other. And it was our project, it was our innovation. So everybody felt, even if it was just a question of where that screw hole should be, uh, they were not shy about bringing their ideas forward and developing a better shared solution. Well, that increases the actual well-being of the workers, but it of course makes the provision of the service much better. And that's true. It's probably true in spades for those uh, bits of the administrative structure that are left to the government to do, designing of roads, water systems, a whole range of things. And governments have just not even started to think about how to do that in a way that increases the well-being of the people right there, quite independent of whether it's three inch pipes or four inch pipes or whose houses get linked up. It's a question about finding together uh, something that gives better lives for everybody. And that's, we're a long way from that. Because you could imagine, you've got to break my example I used in the elder care facility. I, I, I gave you some feeling for the administrative structures that have to be broken down. But it's equally true in the design of sewage systems or stormwater systems or you name it. Housing is very important in this. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, question from Chelsea now. This is, this is an interesting one. Uh, I understand there's a distinction between life satisfaction and people's sense of purpose. So from a policy perspective, to what ends might we use data that tell us about eudaimonia? And you might you might want to explain uh, in a couple of sentences what do we mean by eudaimonia? Yeah. Well, it's 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 a it's a. I, I think I mentioned at the beginning that a purpose of life, which is a typical question that's called a question about eudaimonia. Uh, this the word eudaimonia has been picked up uh, and used too narrowly. It's been used, I think, by a, a lot of researchers who think of it as a description of people acting in a moral way for others. So it, regardless of whether it affects their happiness or not. So life purpose is example and various kind of measures of, of, uh, of moral quality. Uh, and what Aristotle really said, I think, was that the good life depends on those. So these so-called eudaimonic variables Eudaimonia to me is the happiness as a whole. And these good life variables are critically important, but they're on the right hand side of the explanation. They're not what we're trying to explain. Of course, you want to know what it takes to develop a sense of life purpose and think about education in those terms and so on. But it's part of what goes into the making of a high quality of life. So they're important variables, all these eudaimonic variables. I, I don't call them eudaimonic variables because uh, to me, the eudaimonia is happiness as a whole. And uh, Aristotle was quite explicit. He said, a virtuous life is critically important, but it's not all of life. And these other practical parts and it just sheer having fun are part of life too. And the overall life is going to depend on virtue for sure. And to neglect it is neglecting a good part of what will draw us out of bad situations because what's normally discussed as virtue in religious and philosophical traditions, it's all good to have. You don't want it to replace fun and you got, there are good ways of developing it without it becoming a, 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 a sad or over rigid structure. Thank you. Um, question from Tim now, and we're going to move towards trust uh, and trustworthiness and social capital type issues. He asks, in countries like the US where trust has fallen a lot, has trustworthiness as measured by the wallet experiment and others held up? For example, 
Are we just looking at realigning a realignment of perceptions with reality? Uh, or have declines in trust led to or been led by declines in trust within this? Uh, and then following up, if it's just misperception, what do we know about why people are underestimating how trustworthy other people are? Uh, I'll start with the last question, which in my view is the most interesting part of uh, Tim, Tim's question, because what we do know is that everywhere in the United States included, um, people are too pessimistic about whether their wallet would be returned. And so if they're, if they're less likely now to think it would be returned, um, they're getting worse. They're not adjusting to reality. They're adjusting away from reality. And my guess is that uh, uh, the actual levels of wallet return, and fortunately we haven't had these experiments over the, across the decades, so we don't know whether they've been going up or down. And I'm sure there are some places one and some places uh, the other. Uh, what can I say? Uh, I wanted to, uh, what was his last? The last, the last question was, um, what do we know about why people are underestimating how trustworthy others are? Yes, thank you, Tim. No wonder I I, I, <laughs> I said how interesting it was and then forgot it. The, uh, we don't know very much. We're only recently discovering um, this imbalance between actual trustworthiness and trust. That wallet question is one of the very few where there's actually a way of telling the difference between trust and trustworthiness. You have to have, and it was brought in by some of my uh, at the behest of some of my skeptical colleagues who said, how do we know what this trust question measured? You've got to have it in a very specific context. Well, we were lucky enough to choose a specific context where you could actually measure trustworthiness and trust and see whether they were over trusting or, or not. And it's critically important because if I come along and say, trust your neighbor, think of the stranger as a friend you haven't met yet, and really they're about to be knifed by this friend they haven't met yet, then uh, you come along as a uh, as a uh, person who simply is wearing rose-colored spectacles and they're going to get run over. If the world itself, in fact, is much more trustworthy than people think it is, then you're in a real win-win situation to get them to adjust their trust measures towards reality. Because if you think other people are trustworthy, you're going to act differently towards them. You're going to open up more towards them, but itself will feed back and produce a higher level of mutual information, mutual positive interactions, and higher trust. So it's a, it, 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 answering that part of Tim's question, find out what makes people so pessimistic about the, the other people, and then trying to open up the information system as a way that removes that pessimism. We've already talked, and I've already mentioned what I think the primary culprit is. The primary culprit is uh, what people see in the media. It's not just social media and polarized uh, information sources. It's just the fact that journalism in general has been built on the idea that people want to see negative things and they don't want to see positive things. And I think, uh, uh, there are a number of networks that have tried to actually do something about that and found, in fact, people are glad to hear. But they, they have to be realistic, right? Um, and it's one of the thing about natural disasters is that that gives you an experiment. And, and, and so earthquakes happening in different parts of Italy, for example, the consequences for well-being and for earthquake repair are quite different. And so, and, and you get these disasters in places with fairly high levels of social trust where people do come out and help each other. People are actually happier as a consequence. And part of the reason for that must be because they had previously underestimated the extent to which they would help each other. And they see everybody coming out to help each other. They say, goodness, isn't this nice? It makes them more likely to do it themselves. So that's what makes Tim's question such an important one. We want to find out we want to build a base of information that supports a level of trust that's not too high, not too low, but just right. And then try and, of course, make the environment more trustworthy 
Excellent. So I'm going to I'm going to give you one more question, um, John, from from the audience. Um, I know you've been talking a long time, and thank you. Um, it's been a long session, but the, the final question is a is a more um, I suppose high level question, uh, and I'm going to combine here a question from Tim and a question from Bettina, which is that uh, well, New Zealand's life satisfaction national life satisfaction statistics are flat or declining despite good economic growth. Uh, is this something you see in other developed countries? And what do you think are the best options to improve uh, the statistics, life satisfaction statistics, I assume? And Bettina's asking a related question, which I think, which is about, can work on subjective well-being explain the Easterlin paradox? Ah, well, um, There is, I mean, the, the, the evidence on, uh, I mean, basically the Easterlin paradox has income to, as well-being depend more on relative income than absolute income. And there is a fair amount of evidence supporting that proposition, uh, which doesn't seem to be as obvious in the case of happiness as it is in the case of income. There are specific examples, for example, of a Swiss study showing that people were less happy in those in those regions where there were more Lamborghinis on the street, this is sort of the the demonstration effect, uh, and 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 you find it's more prevalent. There's some research suggesting it's more prevalent um, in those places where uh, material standards of life are obvious, and so you look at the the countries that have higher standards of uh, general levels of well-being. They're typically ones where people don't show their material wealth. They don't boast about uh, themselves at all. And they certainly don't boast by having uh, a, a demonstration of others. So uh, there's that twist on the uh, Easterland uh, paradox. The actual timing of changes in economic growth and changes in well-being in a particular country to particular uh, time period, the evidence, because the samples are not monstrous typically, and there's much going on in life at all, be a mistake to look at, to try and infer too much too quickly about that. It's, it's kind of natural, right? If one indicator is down, you want to say, well, what, what are the other indicators that are up and down? The, that's a pretty complicated scene, uh, and the dynamics are, we, we were doing some of that in the COVID times with surveys every two weeks in 15 countries and got some interesting stuff out of it. Um, but the life evaluations themselves were very stable. Uh, and and that's, that's to be expected. So you don't want to read too much in that because people accumulate evidence uh, before they change their overall life evaluation. Yes, you would hope they would. Uh, yeah. Um, exactly. well, uh, John, I'm, I'm going to draw things to a close now um, and to the audience. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, I'm apolo apologies if I didn't get to absolutely everybody. I know there are some that asked a question that, that I didn't get to, but what I, as I said, I did try to, to cover the ones that had the most likes um, and also uh, covered the territory of, of our early, earlier conversation in the first half, John. Um, but what I would like to do uh, to close is just thank you once again um, for a fascinating discussion uh, for a fascinating conversation with me and for answering the questions <coughs> excuse me of our participants um, I, I know it's been a long time uh, you know a long time to talk so thank you for that um, your expertise and experience once again is, is really stimulating really valuable uh, and I'm sure we all well I certainly got a lot out of it and I'm, I'm sure the audience did too um, to everyone, please look out for the upcoming events in our wellbeing seminar series. Uh, as I mentioned, we have some, some more uh, great overseas speakers coming, uh, such as Romley Mokak in October. Uh, John, please. <laughs> I wanted at least to have one final word. Oh, of course. Way, thanks and congratulations to New Zealand and the Treasury for taking wellbeing as seriously and practically. Uh, as you have done. You're a, a, not just in COVID, but uh, before and beyond. You've been a beacon for those of us in other countries working in the field. So thank you very much. Oh, John, thank you. That's uh, that's very kind of you. Um, we're always 
in New Zealand, may I speak for the rest of New Zealand and say that we're always willing to be a laboratory for the rest of the world and it's great to have people interested uh, in our case. Um, so uh, let me just finish with, with my advertisement for Romney Mokak, who is the Australian Productivity Commissioner's Australian Productivity Commission's first Indigenous Policy Evaluation Commissioner. He's coming as part of this series in October. He'll be uh, doing a session. And then in November, we have Nobel Laureate in Economics, Professor Joe Stiglitz, uh, who among many other things many people will know, was one of the authors of the Stiglitz Send for Tusi Commission's report on the measurement of economic performance and social progress back in 2009, which of course was and still is highly influential in wellbeing policy um, including in New Zealand. So let me finish our seminar today uh, formally. Um, once again, thank you, John. Uh, it has been terrific to have your time and expertise. Farewell to uh, all of you. And what I'd like to do is finish with a whakatauki, which is a Māori language proverb. And this whakatauki that I'm going to read to you says that discussion, learning, understanding, and knowledge underpin the well-being of all people. Mā te kōrero, ka mōhio. Mā te mōhio ka marama, mā te marama ka mātou, mā te mātou ka ora te iwi. Haumie, huie, taikie. Thank you once again, John, and to everyone for participating today. Mātou